All right, everybody, welcome to Honors 100 Comparative Classics. We are now shifting back. We are shifting a little bit far more forward in time. We just finished Plato's Republic. We're now doing Marcus Aurelius. More specifically, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Um, we will be doing this for two, four classes. So that's two weeks. Um, it, of course, you could make a whole class out of this book if you wanted to. And who knows, maybe someday I will. But for now, this is that is not the function of this class. We're going to get into it. Um, uh, for community members, anybody who's not in the class proper, welcome. Uh, the first slide of this class, we are going to go over our Plato paper and kind of big themes. So if that, if you're not a, a big fan of that, you can literally come back in ten minutes and we'll be talking about meditations. So uh, just point that out. And any questions or comments, of course, like normal, please type them in the chat. I am happy to answer them as they come up. Okay, here we go. All right, let me get my paper here. I have a lot of physical notes. I don't know how I teach without them. Okay, so um, we're going to do our Plato Papers comments. And these are my comments, right? Um, just general feedback, etc. Now, we already started this in the Discord a little bit, where it was more specific information. But uh, let's do some general information. So first, uh, the good news, if you're curious, the math fundamentals were better. Um, first, the mean was up. Uh, before, I think we were 84 percent we we're 86 this time so uh, it's great and our standard deviation decreased from about I think we were 9 or 10 percent last time and now we're down to 7.7 .7. that just means that 68 percent of the scores are within seven points of 86 so most people were plus or minus seven from this which is good, right? That's a, that means we're all doing pretty well. Again, this is an honors class, so that doesn't shock me. Um, I will progressively raise my standard as the semester goes, as in the more you guys write and get my feedback, hypothetically, you'd do better. <laughs> or at least know what my standards are. So I do tend to get a little more demanding as we go, but it's not going to be night and day. Like If you're, if you're doing well in the papers and you keep, do, keep reading, keep arguing the main points, you should be fine. Now, um, we already kind of did this first feedback. Uh, we did it on our previous class, actually. So I'm not going to harp too much on these ones specifically. But several people, and one reason I brought it up was grading the papers. Um, word definitions matter. Things like good and happiness and justice. Right? Happiness doesn't equal pleasure. Good doesn't mean things I like. <laughs> so, d when you're arguing something logically, the foundation of logic must be we use the same language. Remember the code of conduct the first day? One reason I say definitions matter and we use classic objective definitions for words is because otherwise we just can't communicate and everything breaks. So don't get me wrong. Like we said earlier, you're going to run this professors who are fine with that. And they're welcome to have it. That is not my problem. We are running by a more object objective metric here. So all right. Now, as last time, logic issues reared their head again um, for some people. I'm going to remind you, organization matters, but also because it leads, if you don't have good organization and good structure, it can lead to logical issues. Your ideas need to build off themselves. The worst you can do is like drop a random cliche, like call Plato a name and walk away. You know, I mean, uh, do, is Plato perfect? Do I love everything Plato did? No. But, like, just calling names at Plato. You know, Plato is the poopy pants because he doesn't like democracy. Right? Nobody actually wrote that. But it's an example, right? That's not an argument. That's just you calling Plato names. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes calling names is effective, but not in a, uh, not in a paper where we're searching for understanding and analysis. So, you know, to make sure to build one after another. Now, if you're having trouble with fundamentals of logic... Uh, and it's, even after reading these books, it's hard. Come talk to me. I'm happy to help you guys work through this. Or if you're not sure your argument lines up logically, come to one of the office hours. I will be happy to help you uh, figure out if you're, what's missing in your kind of logic tree before you start writing. I'm really happy to help with that. It's not. It's you know. It's what office hours are for. And especially our papers now do after Wednesday, right? I think I made it do Friday or something crazy. Um, I think it was the 17th. Might be Saturday. So you'll have some time to come ask me. So feel free to if you're having this is your struggle um, now the two key questions here they're separate questions 
But these are what you should have kind of been answering when you're analyzing Plato's state. So, what are these two questions? Firstly, is his state just? Is the Plato's Republic just? This is one question. The second question, could it exist, is a separate question. A lot of people kind of skipped the first one and just said it couldn't exist. Okay, but that doesn't mean he's wrong, right? It's a philosophy book. It's, you know, it's poetry. It's actually creative writing. Imagine, like, going, Star Wars can't exist, so it's stupid. There's a lot of reason to think Star Wars is stupid without thinking it can't exist, right? So, so critique the idea itself. So is Plato's state just? And if not, why not, right? Break it down. Like, what is missing to make it unjust? Or even if you said it was just, why would it be hard to exist? Now, some people did do this very well, by the way. So if you did this, don't worry, right? So is it just or unjust? And then could it exist? And this is where the analysis comes in, right? You could compare it to systems that have existed. And then that would be a whole paper. So something good to keep in mind. Um, generally, this came back to overgeneralizations still hurt. So just saying, you know... Uh, almost like Wikipedia argumentation. Because Wikipedia is not supposed to have arguments, right? But if you're just like, you know, um, if you just said something super broad, like Plato's Republic is bad because it did not have democracy. And that's it. You just stop. That's a claim, right? That's a claim. Now you need reasoning and evidence, <laughs> right? So the way arguments work, claim, reason, evidence. Claim, reason, evidence. Claim, reason, evidence. If you don't have all of those, you're not making an argument. You're just saying words to my face. So make sure when you make a claim, prove it. Right? And again, like I use that example of democracy because several people made democratic arguments and then didn't refer to Plato's definition of a democracy. So if you were going to argue and say democracy is good, you'd also have to argue against Plato's definition of a democracy and why it's not full or correct. Or even if it was correct, why you still think it's better in a logical sense. All right. Uh, this one was obvious. I already mentioned this, so I'm not going to waste too much time on it. But obviously, what is justice was the fundamental question to answer. And if you just said he liked justice and stuff, but you didn't go into it, that hurts you. So whenever we're doing an analysis of any work, my class or any other class, try to figure out what is the main point, right? What is the fundamental question you should answer to prove understanding of the source? For this one, it was what is justice? And, you know, what is justice for Plato, obviously, right? So what do I, because the best arguments had something like, they showed Thrasymachus, remember, Thrasymachus disagreed with Plato, and then Glasson and Adamantius argued Thrasymachus's position more, but they didn't agree with him. So, but, you know, the more you can be clear about that, you show me you understand it, the better. And if you didn't pick this up at all, that the book's about justice, you either didn't read it or you, you, you read, I don't, I don't know, I, every chapter deals with justice. Like, why do we talk about education? Justice. <laughs> right? You can't have just people without good communication. Why do we talk about incomplete states? Their relation to a just state. Why do we talk about the afterlife? It's relation to justice, <laughs> right? Like, why do we talk about uh, art? It's relation to education, so it connects to justice, right? Like, everything in this book connected back to justice. And if you just miss that, I, as a reader who's grading you, is suspect you even read the book. Now, I generally didn't give you F minuses if you didn't really show an understanding of this, but if you wondered, like, why didn't I get an A? Or, or like, why did I get a low B or a high C or something? It might be you didn't address justice sufficiently. Okay. Another one, uh, words come back. We t I talk a lot about words because it matters. Words actually mean something. So when you use a word and you say it's a good thing and you're disagreeing with the author, you then have to go into it. You can't just say it and walk away. It goes back to this overgeneralization. The, there's a couple, two of these especially were very, actually no, all four were pretty prevalent. So the first one, this word is really popular in our time. In the last 100, 200 years, it's been everywhere. People love it. A certain subdivision of people especially. E people love to talk about equality. Okay, but the, the problem with using this word is it means something. Besides literally meaning this mathematical notation, right? Equal is equal, which is is, which is to exist, which means same, which means no distinguishing feature. 
right? This is what equality means. Equality means everything same, right? Everything is equal, everything is, everything is, you know, sameness, everything has no distinguishing features. And several of the good and papals that were struggling both pointed out, actually, that in, Arist in uh, Plato's definition, um, this was his critique of democracy. Now, what's wrong with sameness? Well, if everything is the same for Plato, if we're looking at a Plato perspective, then you're not differentiating the small from the great, or the good from the evil, or the skilled from the unskilled, right? If somebody's skilled at philosophy and not skilled, if we're all equal, we can't have distinguishing characteristics, right? You couldn't have merit, because then we wouldn't be the same, right? Because merit means one is working better than another. So equality has its shortcomings, and if you if you didn't address those, you weren't dealing with Plato who talked about the shortcomings. Does that make sense? Like you could acknowledge the shortcomings and say yes, however, and then make an argument. That's what I was looking for. So if you didn't do that, next time if you wanted to make an equality argument, that's what you should be doing. And this will be inherently more difficult because the ancients in general weren't big fans of equality. However, our next two books is where we're going to get as close as you're going to get. Uh, Marcus Aurelius and St. Augustine both at least are for moral how can you say it? Like access to morality equally for everyone. That doesn't mean everybody's equal. Everybody is everybody has moral equality, but everyone could be equally access to morality. It's it's a difference. Freedom. This one came back a lot. Um, and again, this one was addressed in Plato's discussion of democracy as well. So. This came up a lot as an argument, and, and I'll be honest, as a critique of Plato, and it's not a bad one. Um, but the, the problem with freedom and equality, the question that pops up in my mind is, what about skill? Just because someone quote-unquote wants something does not, give, uh, does not give them the skill to get it, and um, just because you desire or you have a sense for allowing something, can you impose yourself on others just because you want it, right? Because that's a lot of the time that what freedom is. So wanting something and the ability to have it are not the same. So is, is, is a lot of people's definition of freedom is, well, if people want it, they should have it. That's, why do I point out the problem with that? That sounds really good for a lot of modern people. Well, what if somebody wants to murder or to subjugate you for a thousand generations and have your family slaves? They want it. And what if they want it and they have the ability to have it? Shouldn't they have the freedom to have that? Do you see the, the problem? If you're going to make any kind of freedom argument, because um, freedom is also freedom from things. Like, equality means something, right? Freedom also means free from. So, like, right, like, free, Plato would say, like, what's wrong with freedom? What if you're free from morality or you're free from justice or you're free from self-control? That would be his critique. Um, and this ties in straight into the next one, right? Techna, right? Uh, and a lot of people looked at techna negatively. Uh, I will point out, techna is actually a positivist idea in Greek thought. Why? Because there's the idea underneath it that you, everyone could is able to be good at something, right? Morally and with the skill. And it's positivist. So the basic claim is everyone has something they're good at. It might not be the thing you want, right? It might not be your quote-unquote free choice. But there's a positive assumption in Tecna that everybody has some Tecna, one Tecna. So it could, quote-unquote, be oppressive, right? It's not, quote-unquote, free, but it's not negative in a moral sense. Because it's, instead of saying everyone is the same, and everyone's freely the same with no differentiation, Tecna is kind of the opposite. They're saying, you have the thing you're quite good at, but you have something you're good at. With equality, you can't be good at anything. Because good separates from not good or evil, right? Or, you know, skilled and unskilled. So then you don't have equality anymore. Do you guys see the logical problem here? Again, doesn't mean you have to like Tecna. Doesn't mean you have to dislike equality. I'm just pointing out the logical issues here when you're trying to make an argument. And finally, all of this tying into education, a lot of people, and by a lot, I'd say more than five people made a three f free thought and expression argument for education. Generally speaking, right, ties into f the freedom, right? It was a, it, many people who made a freedom argument made this argument for education. Um, and I might, the point I'd make here is even for children, because that's what Aristotle was, ar Plato was arguing, I mean, Plato was arguing for child controlling children's education. 
So you, are you saying there should be free thought and expression even for children and towards children? So we could teach children anything, man. It's freedom. So if we teach children to murder or we teach pedophilia, do you, do you see the problem yet? Right? So uncritical examination of ideas is the problem. It's not if you like free thought and expression and be like, ah, see for you. No, 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 no. It's how you argue it. Does that make sense? So even now, basically nowhere is there quote unquote free thought and expression for children. Everybody knows you should, like, everybody acts like you should control what you teach kids, but the argument is what do we teach them? Does that make sense? So now, if you're going to argue for no limitations, why? A lot of people just said free thought and expression and moved on. No, 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 no. You're arguing we should teach kids all violence, all horror, all porn, all sexual things, all perverse things, and all good things. Why? Right? That's on you to argue why the, you know, 5,000 years of educating children is wrong and you are right. Do you see the, there's this logical tree you have to build, otherwise you're just shooting platitudes at me, like a cannon, and they miss because... They're not backed up by anything. So again, remember we talked about focus, uh, especially for the next paper, it's only two pages. This is where focus helps, right? So if you're gonna make an equality or freedom or techno or an education argument, you know, nail it down on it. Focus on it and break it down in a, a way that makes sense. Oh, and finally, I want to remind people, if you're gonna use foreign language words, make sure to use italics, like eudaimonia or techna. It helps your read, it's a proper format, and it helps your reader understand that you're using a foreign language loan word. All right. Uh, if, if this class, if you guys have any questions about this, please ask me after or in an office hour. I'm happy to, and the stream will be up. So if you want to review this later, you can, and then come ask me, and I'm happy to break it down more. All right, let's get into uh, meditations. Hopefully you guys open your book. And I will open mine. Now, if you realize, the copy I asked you to pick is... Loeb Classics. Now, why would I pick Loeb Classics? Because, generally speaking, they have great translations. They're slightly older. I like the hardcover version. And uh, a lot of modern translations make a lot of mistakes. So, Loeb Classic is still probably my favorite and probably the most widely accepted um, language version. Now, if you don't speak Greek, it's okay. I don't speak Greek either. I read some Latin. So, it's so like the sayings of Marcus. I can actually read the sayings of Marcus. I can't really read the Greek. I I'm someday I'll learn Greek. I need it. But uh, for now, no. All right. So let's get into this, folks. So introduction. Who is this guy? Well, he's a Roman, if you didn't figure that out yet. Uh, and you can open your book flap, right? It's right here. Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher. Oh, he's an emperor. Nice. Born at Rome. Received training under his guardian and uncle, Antonius Pius, who adopted him. He was converted to Stoicism and henceforth studied and practiced philosophy and law. And it mentions he's a gentleman, lived in agreement and collaboration with Antonius Pius. He married his daughter, Faustina, and succeeded him as emperor. And then he spent a bunch of time fighting and had a really rough reign, right? Fearful natural disasters, including floods, earthquakes, epidemics, threatened revolts, Parthian war, which is a uh, Parthians were a tribe uh, nowadays, Iraq and Persia. Pressure from barbarians north of the Alps, my ancestors, the Germans. And then from 1869 to, uh, or 169 to 180, he fought wars in the north for the rest of his reign, basically. So he had a really chaotic reign. But, and this is, this is actually where we get the book. This book is actually his journal, kind of, his jottings, his reflections, right, meditations, uh, while on campaign versus the barbarians. That's almost all of what this book is. So it's it's a little a little window into a life of this man. I'm getting my notes out. I gotta shuffle. Here we go. Yeah. And a one big focus of this book and Stoic philosophy in general, he wrote it for himself as a means of self critique and analysis. Now, why would he do that? Obviously, the goal is self improvement. That is what that's and in Stoic philosophy, Stoic philosophy's goal is also self improvement. So the, the goal of this book was to critique and analyze himself, but think about this. This is the, one of the most powerful humans in all of human history, and he still spends time self-critiquing himself. And if you don't know anything about the Roman Empire, at this time, 
the Roman Empire is near its height. Uh, it controlled all of Europe, uh, and when I say Europe, it's the classic Europe, so it includes the Mediterranean. So this is Spain, France, all of Italy, southern Germany, Britain, um, North Africa, all the way from the, the Titan Rocks to Palestine. Controlled all of that. It controlled the Middle East, it controlled Turkey, um, Greece, lots of parts of Eastern Europe, huge, all the Balkans. This is a gigantic, multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. Still one of the most powerful, greatest empires in world history. Uh, I don't know if you guys studied in school. Uh, we, we did a little bit. I would say it's definitely, it was understudied when I was a kid, and I bet you it's, it's very understudied now. But one reason so much of Western thought is focused on Rome is because Rome was great, right? It was a thousand, it was ha like the whole thing lasted a thousand years, and then the, the, the eastern half lasted another thousand years. <laughs> Right? It's a big deal anyway. And then like the biggest religion in the world just happens to speak their language. And its its head is in the capital of this empire. Right? Like we're still living in a Roman system. And as the intro mentions, um, we still use Roman law. Still, now, today, we use Roman law in our courts in the United States. Welcome. <laughs> so no matter how you feel about Rome, it's important, and Marcus Aurelius is one of the more, he might be one of the most important Roman philosophers. There's maybe a handful, most, and as we mentioned here, right, most of the big philosophers were Greeks. Alright, and then style-wise, what does our translator tell us? Well, it's simple style, it's straightforward, and there's a, there's a certain dignity of thought here. And, as he points out, pretty good rhetoric. Um, Again, this is a very both Roman character and who Marcus is, right? He's not just a philosopher, but he's a warrior. So, makes sense. Let's see, this is Roman numeral 13. And they mention about Stoicism. Stoicism, we'll get into it in a second. But they mention that he doesn't actually have this. Uh, he, he has only somewhat rigid dedicism and spiritual dogmatism of his predecessor. Marcus Aurelius is humbler and not so confident. The hardness and arrogance of Stoicism are softened in him by an infusion of Platonism and other philosophies. And by the way, Platonism is literally Plato's philosophy. Neoplatonism was huge in the Roman world. So, all right. Um, and uh, a big goal of this book is to try to reason with his own soul and understand, you know, transcend reason over flesh. And we'll get into their theory a lot as we go. Now, why should we care about this book? Like, what is the warrant? Just, it's, a, it's an old book, who cares? Um, it helped gr mold a lot of great men, except for Marcus Aurelius. Um, uh, very popular in certain parts of the world. Uh, several of the people it mentions are actually Germans. They mentioned uh, Maxim, uh, Frederick the Great, who is one of the greatest uh, emperors of Prussia and Germany. Uh, Maximilian of Bavaria, who was a famous king of Bavaria. Uh, they mentioned uh, John Smith, um, a British general, and the king of reunified Italy in the 19th century. So there is a long list of people who have gotten something out of this book. Now, it might not be something you want, but we'll get, we'll find out, right? But it's very interesting that it's still, it moved up until the 19th century, and actually it's quite popular now in the 21st century with random tech people. A lot of tech people are Stoics. Uh, it's their chosen life philosophy. So, and we'll get into why that perhaps might be the case. My next slide totally didn't format right, and it made me sad. Cool. Any questions so far about just the intro? I'll give it 15 seconds before we jump into what is Stoicism. Alright, let's keep going. I did not see any questions. 
And if you ever type a question slower than I give you a break, I'll get to it when it pops up, don't worry. You're not interrupting me, it's just text. Okay, so meditations, it has another, like a second introduction where it starts to get into what are Stoics? Where do they come from? What do they believe? Okay, like many Roman Empire, ain't classic world philosophies, it starts in Athens. <laughs> just like Plato and Socrates, right? And it, it was from a guy called Zeno in 300 BC. It's a Greek philosophy. It brought new moral force into the world. Uh, and as the book points out, it's more religious than other Greek philosophies. And their focus was on, for sure, much more moral attitude. And it tended to be much more um, passion-based. Now, in spite of the origin of this, it proved wonderfully adapted to practical Roman, Roman character, as the book points out. Um, and it points out here, quote, under the tyranny of the early Caesars, it formed the only impenetrable fortress of liberty for the noblest Romans. Now, why would that be? Well, they, they went from a republic to a empire, right? So there was no more representation, etc. So now the only kind of freedom for people was in their own minds, right? In your own lives, in your own minds. That was the only place you could really be free. But that doesn't mean freedom's dead. And you could argue that, and the book does, Marcus Aurelius is, or is and also known as Marcus Antonius, um, he is the pinnacle of Stoic philosophy. So, I mean, think about it, right? You have an emperor who believes a philosophy. It's definitely going to spread and have a longer influence. Without a doubt. And I'm checking my notes. Great. Okay, and there's three major fields that Stoics thought were important, which is logic, physics, and ethics. Logic is dialectics and rhetoric, and to remind you what these are, dialectic is search for the truth, Rhetoric is the ability to speak well. Also, the Romans' favorite pastime, by the way. And these are necessary instruments of speculation. Um, physics is study of the physical realm, obviously. Marcus Rulius didn't really care. And by the way, they mention here too, a keynote of Stoicism was life according to nature, big N nature. Now, I don't have this on the slide, I'm just going to read it, but it's in your book if you're curious. Nature, nature, quote unquote, was meant the controlling reason of the universe. Let me say that again. Nature was meant the controlling reason of the universe. So whenever you say reason or nature in this book, it's referring specifically to there's the reason that controls the universe. And th this is why they'd study physics. Because if the, if the universe, if nature itself is connected to the reason of the universe, you have to study the cosmos to understand where we are. And as they point out, it's a scientific basis for philosophy, but they say it's strictly subordinate to the philosophy. It's a means to an end, not an end. And they mentioned Marcus was well versed in Stoic physics, he just wasn't very good at it. And in the Stoic universe, talking about all this, God and matter were one. Um, they're all, so as I say here, uh, this is uh, Roman numeral 22 if you're curious. Stoics, to the Stoics, the universe, capital U, God and matter, capital G, capital M, was one, that's capital O, all substance, that's a big S, unified by the close sympathy and interdependence of the parts, forming with the rational power that was co-extensive to all of it, a single entity, then the next word says, the primary being, by means of informing force, acting in genius or atmospheric current on the inherent matter, evolved out of itself a cosmos, subsequent modifications being the way of consequence. Thus, the universe was periodically destroyed by fire, thus returning again to its pristine being. However, to be created anew on the same plan, even to the smallest detail, and so on forever. Huh. It's almost like uh, the Big Bang uh, is an original. Man. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Basically all modern ideas 
uh, we had in the Greek and Roman world. It's really funny. That's why we don't study them anymore. Otherwise, you'd go like, oh, we're not that original. Not really. Now, this basically means they're pantheists, which means matter is God and God is manner. Or also sometimes called panatheist. So there's not a separation between God and matter in the Stoics. Now, as the book says, God and matter being thus indistinguishable for all that was not God in its original form is indirect sense a manifestation of him the stoic creed was an inevitably pantheistic it was also materialistic this is good to know for the stoics allowing existence nothing incorporeal by means of their strange theory of air currents inherent even in the abstract things such as virtue rendered not only them but God himself corporeal terming him the quote perfect living being unquote so Stoics are some of the first pure materialists. Everything is matter. All causation is matter. Even virtue and spiritual things, it's all matter. Again, does this sound familiar? Yes, we live in a pretty materialist time where many, 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 many people act like all causation is material causation. So the Stoics are some of the first genuine materialists, which again makes it really interesting because living in a, I would say, at least a plurality materialist age um, it's relevant and by the way, when, I, when we say materialist when I say like, you think of like a I don't know, bad 90s songs, and you think of like a material girl in a material world what does that mean? When you say something is a materialist normally you mean somebody who just likes to buy stuff but th there's actually a philosophy under it right? It means buying stuff can make you happy and better off Right? That's what materialism is, right? It's stuff changes your reality. So, like, if, if, if you believe money will make you happy, that's materialism, right? You think more of a number or more of a piece of paper can make you happy. So, something to think about. Um, now, ethics, interestingly enough, though, ethics, generally speaking, this is the third branch, right? Ethics for them got closer to... Christian ethics. Now, Christianity and Stoicism were co-habitating the Roman Empire. Now, for the first bit, this period, when Marcus Aurelius is the emperor, Christianity was illegal, punishable by death, and Stoicism was practiced by the emperor. So, you know, one had a leg up. However, one did not win in the end. Um, although, we still have it around. Now, why is, there, why is there something here? As the book points out, in this cosmopolitanism, the Stoics approach the Christian view. Ethics being divorced from national politics and made of universal application. It was no cloistered virtue the Stoics preached, showing how a man can save his own soul, but a practical positive goodness. Though it cannot be denied claims of the self-sufficiency of the inner self, and another Greek word I can't read, the social interdependence of parts of the common whole are not easy to reconcile. I need to ask one of my friends who read Greek. Anyway, it is certain, however, the stoic admission of slaves into the brotherhood of man had an ameliorating effect upon slavery, and the well-known bias of Marcus in favor of enfranchisement may well have been due to his creed. And then we get a little more detail here. Um, From virtue alone can happiness and peace of mind result. The virtue consists of submission to the higher power and all that he sends us in mastery over our animal nature, in freedom from all perturbation, like being angry, and in the entire independence of the inner self. Since life is an opinion, in everything but what we think is, I'll think it, the vital question is what assent we give to the impression of our senses. So this is a key of stoic thought. Let me say that again. So it's what we think of our everything we think the vital impression is sent to give impression of our senses and the I'll quote Marcus then explain it. it says quote here quote wipe out imagination unquote and you are saved do not think of yourself hurt and you will remain unhurt he longs for the day when he shall cease to be duped by the impressions and pulled like a puppet by his passions and his soul shall be a great calm but virtue must also show itself like faith in right actions this is again where there's a Christian overlap it means not only self-control, but justice and benevolence to others and piety towards the gods. So the, the Stoics thought 
even though they're materialists, they're ethics, they believe that you, if you're virtuous, the outer world cannot impact your inner world. This is why they mention like slaves having equal treatment. One of the big three Stoic philosophers was a slave philosopher. Like, so he had no freedom, but he was a philosopher and he worked for a family, basically, as a teacher. And Stoics believe that ethics, we'll get, we'll get to Marcus Willis's many examples, but it, ethics and virtue is controlling yourself in face of all your external stimulus. So really your inner life, inner self, is all that matters for you being a moral person. You still have to act well, right? But once you control your passions and your inner life is balanced and well done, you will be ethical. So it's all internal focused ethical life, not external. It's the idea that once your internal life is good, your external fruits will be good as well. But so this means an emperor or a slave can be equally moral in a stoic view. All right, so this is kind of like the power of yourself versus reality. So you have this uh, ability of your reason and understanding of nature and ethics to like transcend your physical reality. Now they do talk a little bit about destiny, um, big part of this, right? So for example, um, giving into your, like where you many th it's like the Confucius and Mencius many things you can't actually control so you do just sometimes have to concede fully to ethics I'm trying here I'm sorry con concede fully to destiny where's the quote I want here we go um, there are two Oh, um, they mention, um, he bids himself to call upon gods, he believed the gods were there, and follow them, and be their minister, live with them, and liken unto them. They too are part of the cosmos and subject to its limitations, so this is the gods. And by our own loyalty to destiny, we contribute to the welfare and the permanence of God himself. But a predestined order of things involved fatalism, and the Stoics were hard put to maintain complete freedom of the will. So Stoics are fatalists. They think, in the end, everything's controlled by destiny and by understanding physical reality. Us and the gods are all submitted to this destiny, and we should accept it. And they always struggled with it, as, the, as our translator points out, right? It's, it's hard, because how can you have complete freedom of the will and destiny? But the Stoics thought you did have, in, in your own mind anyway, in your inner self, you had total freedom, while at the same time being kind of trapped by destiny. Now, he also mentions uh, they had no room for immortality, Definitely not as positive as the Christian one, although Marcus really hoped there was. They also mentioned suicide, which is kind of depressing, but uh, because if, if this life is his choices, why can't I choose a suicide? Mostly they said you can't do it, because you're kind of snubbing your nose at God. But in rare cases, you could. But then, there is still this core idea here, though, that... that your life must contain universal truth about reality and by understanding yourself and reality and ethics you understand the reality better because remember if everything is god that means you're god and i'm god and you know the slave is god so this has its appeal um even if it's not fully consistent all right any stoic questions and again this whole book is basically stoic philosophy so if this doesn't make a lot of sense yet we're going to get into it because the whole book is a stoic book but uh, any questions I can answer now, we're probably not going to get as far as I'd like. We'll, we'll start book one, anyway. I'll give us 15 seconds. All right. I... Somebody says, what's Roman religion like at this time? Um, normally, uh, it would be what you'd call civic religion. That's a good question. Um, so civic religion means uh, every nation, or more specifically your sub-nation or your city, has certain gods and festivals you have to follow. And these are the traditional Roman pantheon that you guys probably learned a little bit about in school. You know... Um, 
So Jupiter, um, his wife, is, Hera is the Greek name. Her, I forget her Roman name right now. Right, but their big pantheon with all their gods. The observance of the specific gods in your region is their religion. So it's like a civic religion. Imagine it's like your public-facing religion. So, for example, you could be a Stoic and still follow your civic gods, or a Platonist and still follow your civic gods. So that's one reason Christianity was uh, illegal from the start is they were not allowed to follow the civic gods. Now, how did there was there any carve outs? Yes, the Hebrews had their carve out basically. They got conquered by the Romans, and once you got conquered by the Romans, the Romans would say you can keep your culture, just pay us your taxes. But the, since the Christians were converts and not conquered peoples, um, they had a really hard time because Christians weren't allowed to show observations to the civic gods. So yeah, but imagine every city just had like a Zeus temple and you had to, on certain days, you had to go sacrifice a goat. That's what the religion was like. But it's a giant pantheon. So I'm actually reading another book about it right now. They had gods to virtue and got, like the, the Romans took the Greek gods and went a uh, little insane. Like I think just the door, they had three door gods. There was like do a god of entrances, and then a god of hinges, and a god of opening. Like they went really, they got really finite with their god observations. So by this time, the uh, by the three uh, hundreds, I think, the Romans had a, a plethora of gods, and then places they'd conquer. Sometimes they'd absorb those gods too. <laughs> like a Mithra is a, a, a woman god from um, Mesopotamia. Why'd they get it? Well, they, she filled the gap they needed. Or they got some of the Egyptian gods, yeah, became Greek gods, for example, or Roman gods, just because they, uh, you know, why not? <laughs> so it was very uh, polytheistic. That's a nice way to say it. That's a good question. All right. Uh, all right, let's have do one slide, and then we'll be free. We'll talk about book one. All right. So, uh, and again, like our other class, I try to have nice pictures. Because otherwise, what are we doing here? You know, it's nice to have something to look at. So, we get his book, and he jumps right in. And these are just his little notes to himself. And the first bit is, broadly speaking, inherited character and gratitude. So he thanks a bunch of people. So he says, from my grandfather Varus, a kindly disposition and a sweetness of temper. From what I have heard of my father and my memory of him, modesty and manliness. From my mother, fear of God and generosity. Abstention not only from doing ill, but every, from very thought of doing it. And furthermore, to live the simple life, far removed from the habits of the rich. Then he does this for a while. He thanks a bunch of people. From my tutor, um, he realized not to be partisan. If you if you read this one, it didn't make any sense. He says, uh, not to side with the green jackets or the blue and the races, or to back the light shield champion and the heavy shield lists, or to shrink toil to have few wants, to do your own work, mind my own concerns, and turn from deaf ear to slander. So the first bit, uh, the ancients, the Greeks and the Romans and the Byzantines, they spent their politics, they fought more over religion and... Uh, the races, the chariot races, and gladiators, then they fought about politics. Like, they really loved it. So his tutor taught him not be partisan. And he keeps going. He keeps thanking a bunch of people in book one. Um, he's a very grateful man. Is there any big ones here? Yes, hold on. I got my notes. I want to make sure I don't. Ah, uh, da, 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 where's my... Here we go. Book one. Notes. I have so many notes for this book, my goodness. Uh, where's this one on home government? I wrote the one heard of it. That's okay. So Levin says from Fronto, a note on 
Note the envy, the subtlety, the distillation, the habitual or the habitation to a tyrant. And the general rule, those among us who rank as patricians are somewhat wanting in natural affection. Um, so he, uh, this one was a little different. This one was on being a patrician, actually. Uh, but he points out that you have to care, be careful not to be a tyrant. If you know what a patrician is, it's an old Roman word for, like, nobility, but more specifically... Oop, that's too big. I'm going to shrink a little bit. Um, it's the, the perennial um, class that ruled Rome for the most part. So they used to be the Senate, and then they just were the patricians. I like this one, too. This one's very relevant to us. Never saying I'm too busy. This is from 12. and um, From Alexander the Platonist. Not to say to anyone, often or without necessity, or to write in a letter, I am too busy, nor in the fashion constantly plead urgent affairs as an excuse for evading the obligations entailed upon us by our relations towards those around us. <laughs> We could probably learn something from this, right? This is the maybe the most common word in all of the California English language. By the way, if I can give you, it's like, it's like for example, when you don't want to go on a date with somebody. Oh, I didn't spell check that word. Oops. And you just say, there we go. Yeah. When you go on a date with somebody and you say I'm busy, just say no. <laughs> That's what Marcus would say. Um, on self mastery and stability of purpose, let me find this one. I think this is 11. Okay. He mentions from my brother Severus, this is 14, love of family, love of truth, love of justice, and thanks to him, he knew a bunch of people, and this is interesting. Ready for this? And the conception of a state with one law for all, based on individual equality and freedom of speech, and of a sovereignty which prizes above all things the liberty of the subject and furthermore, from him also, to set a well-balanced and unvarying value on philosophy. Readiness to do others a kindness and eager generosity and optimism. And confidence in the love of friends. Perfect openness in the case of those that came up for his censure. And the absence of any need for his friends to surmise what he did not wish. So plain was it. So if you think we made all these all, uh, all the ideas we use, uh, spoiler folks, uh, this book has been read by a lot of people in the last 500 years, so we get some interesting things there. Uh, and we also, for the self-mastery, that one wasn't even on my slide, it was just a good one. That was 14. Uh, from 15, though, we get from Maximus, self-mastery and stability of purpose. Cheeriness and sickness, as well as in all other circumstances. Remember we talked about the internal life? Stoics thought you should never let your physical circumstances fit, change your internal life and a character justly proportioned of sweetness and gravity and to perform without grumbling the task that lies to one's hand oof now from his father this is from his adopted father by the way his uncle um, he gets a bunch here mildness an unshakable adherence to decisions deliberately come to and no empty vanity in respect to so-called honors. A love of work and thoroughness, and a readiness to hear any suggestion for the common good, an inflexible determination to give every man his due, justice, right? And to know by experience when it is time to insist and when to desist, and this last one's interesting, uh, and to suppress a passion for boys. Don't be a, don't be a pedo. That seems like good life advice. Uh, and he keeps going, actually. He gives his stepfather another whole page. Uh, for example, he is restricting his reign, he was an emperor, to public acclamations of every sort of uh, adulteration, and his unsleeping attention to the needs of the empire, and his wise stewardship of its resources, and the patient tolerance of the censure that all this entailed, and his freedom from superstition with respect to the gods and from hunting for popularity with respect to men by pandering to their desires and courting the mob. Yea, his soberness in all things and steadfastness and the absence in him of all vulgar tastes and any craze for novelty. By the way, when he says superstition, this is interesting. If you want to know the difference between superstition and religion, I'll quote a famous Roman named Varro. He wrote a book on Roman religions. Varro pointed out superstition is fear of the gods 
or spiritual thing. Religion is respect for the gods. An interesting difference. All right, so he learned a lot from his stepfather. And this is the guy who, remember, not only should you ask, are these good traits in a ruler? How, how do we feel about an emperor writing this, right? Like an, a reigning emperor. Do you think he was a good emperor or not? Uh, spoiler, uh, Marcus Aurelius was considered one of the better emperors. Same with uh, Antonius Pius, his uh, uncle. They're two of the more well-regarded emperors in Roman history. And he keeps going. He gives his dad a lot of praise. I think there's a whole other page. Um, he says, besides, this is on uh, 17, he says, besides this also was high appreciation of all true philosophers without any upbraiding of the others, at the same time without any undue subservience to them. And again, excuse me, then again, his easiness of access and his graciousness that yet had nothing fulsome about it. And his reasonable attention to his bodily requirements, not as too fond of life or too vain of his outward appearance, nor yet one who neglected it, but so as his own carefulness to need but very seldom the skill of a leech or medicines and outward applications. He didn't get sick very much. He took care of himself, didn't eat too much, you know, didn't do too much. And I think his dad gets a whole other page. So take a look at it. It's great. Um, from 17, we get what we get from the gods. From the gods, I, oh, from the gods to have great, to have good grandfathers, good parents, a good sister, good teachers, good companions, kinsmen, friends, nearly all of them, and that I fell into no trespass against any of them, and yet I had a disposition that was inclined such as might have led me to something of the sort. Had it so chanced, but by the grace of God there was no such coincidence of circumstances as it was likely to put me to the task. And he keeps going to thank the gods for other stuff, too. It's pretty in-depth. I think we get one more page of it. And at the end, too, interestingly enough, we get a little bit on ability of dreams. And that he says, that this is the last page of book one. That by the agency of dreams, I was given antidotes both to other kinds and against the spilling of blood and vertigo. And there was response also to, at Katia, thou also shalt use it. And that I had sent my heart on philosophy and did not fall to the hands of a sophist, nor sat down on the author's desks, or became a solver of syllogisms, nor busied myself with physical phenomenon. For all above, gods as helpers and good fortune need. Interesting. And the, the footnotes probably point out, every ancient thought, gods, like dreams had actual effect, and a lot of early Christians too. So, interesting. All right, and we're totally out of time. Aha, <laughs> perfect. Any questions before we call it? We didn't get, we got one slide less far than I'd like, but uh, overall I'm pretty happy with it. We're going to look at this nice drawing. Uh, any questions, comments, problems? Now is the time. Otherwise, we'll be free. Because it is the end of class. I'm, I'm very good at going over my time. So I have, to, I have to rein it in. No stream questions. No Discord questions. All right, folks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, listening. I hope you had a good time. P be sure to read up for next class on your meditations. It's a pretty easy read. We'll probably get to book five. That's what I'm aiming for. So besides that, have a beautiful week. I'll see you all in two days. I'll talk to you all soon.